Hello honey bunches! To say I've been a smidge intimidated to make the leap and actually start this epic Harry Potter but vegan series would be a wild understatement. Generations have studied these books and films through simply growing up alongside them and because of its mega enormous fan base with nearly every person on the planet knowing his name, me adding my little log to the fire seems like a rather unnecessary creative maneuver to make. However, I like to be someone of my word, so here I am and hopefully I will see it through to the end. I should come clean and say that by being born in the year the first book came out, me actually reading the series happened embarrassingly late for me. I was 14 when I read the series front to back in every spare moment I had, which for some movie context was between the first and second part of Deathly Hallows coming out. I've always wished I was more of a reader and found it easier to focus my attention and persist when the words on the page didn't entirely grip me, but reading Harry Potter showed me that I could read a book with ease and have that page turning sensation that everyone I knew talked about. Many people say that they found Harry Potter or that Harry Potter helped them through a difficult time growing up or that their difficult childhood was remedied by this series. I only really admitted to myself that this was the case for me a few years ago when I thought about how I did happen to read all the books while I was in between friendship groups and had literally no one or so it felt like to hang around with at recess and lunch. So rather anti-socially I know, I would grab the book I was up to and my lunch, walk briskly to the library, gulp down my lunch as quickly as possible while standing around the entrance with all the people who had similar ideas and then find a spot and forget about my current uncomfortable friendship situation. <laughs> I already was a major fan of the films, especially the scores that I'd been listening to on my wee little mp3 for years, which transpired into me writing but thankfully not sending a seriously long-winded fan letter to composer Alexandra Desplat. I did the eager trips to the bookstore with my brother to get the next book that I would only come to read years later, I know, shame on me, but my rather low-level knowledge fandom was always supported by my encyclopedic older brother growing up who always read the books in under 24 hours to my mum's annoyance that they didn't last longer. Around the time I finally read the series, it just so happened that my family we were planning a trip to the US and the states we were to visit were up for family discussion. The Orlando Harry Potter Park had just opened and so with some serious persuasion we went when I was 14-15 years old and I literally had the best time of my life. Well how anxiety free I was there probably greatly attributed to me saying that over and over again. <laughs> but it was brilliant. Teenager me would eye roll overhearing tourists say, butterbeer they shouldn't be selling alcohol at a theme park and scoff that the knowledge of the people who were lucky enough to grace the park's entrance was so low. <laughs> yes, little shitty me wasn't so good at understanding that my love for the story and the world was one that nearly every second person on the globe shared, yet at different intensities. I suppose over the years as I found friends other than Harry Potter, I became less possessive and more understanding about how much Harry Potter meant to most people. But when I made it to the Harry Potter studios last year, um, when I visited London with my mum, I majorly welled up and probably because the series when I first read it had been more of a comfort than I knew. I'm reasonably confident my Harry Potter knowledge will hold up in the essay parts of this series, however I fully realise that most people are major wizards on the topic. I did reread the series only this past November and note the number of dishes I could veganise from the texts. However, for the most part, the content that I'm delving into, both story and food wise, will be what I've got visual reference for in the films. I'm confident the recipes I have chosen will be actually usable and helpful recipes to have and not sort of novelty sweets like pumpkin pasties and chocolate frogs. I plan to do seven Harry Potter but vegans, merging parts one and two of the Deathly Hallows into one, as fighting rather than food fills a lot of the last instalment. So please be kind while I do my best to adding a little honey bunch flair to possibly the best example of storytelling ever. Okay, so the first instalment, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I watched this for the first time in Yonks, primarily because it was the only one we had on video, and videos are a big bum to rewind, shortly after watching the latest Fantastic Beasts film. And the thing that majorly struck me is how much time and space magic is given in the film. Sure, there's a reason for this, being because the audience, along with Harry, are being introduced to the wizarding world. Yet that aside, I just love that magic is allowed to be a character of its own. It's given time and space to breathe and do its thing, and it's not rushed through or superhero powered up. Sure, the special effects were already being pushed and experimented with at the time of the first film, but I argue that this works to the film's advantage, as it leaves Harry and his experiences to be the centre of the film. Magic isn't used all that much in the first film, granted because Harry hardly knows any, <laughs> but when it is used, it's used really gently, such as the Lee Cauldron sign only appearing as Hagrid and Harry move towards the door. 
It's far from the animation that happens when Newt and Tina enter the entrance to the French equivalent of Diagon Alley in the second Fantastic Beasts installment, so it's subtle and therefore I'd say believable. Okay, so the scene where Dumbledore uses his Deluminator in Privet Drive at the start of the film to put out each and every light one by one <laughs> is a little comical in its pacing, but I think it's nice that despite the film's measured pacing, Faith is always put in the world's ability to ensure the audience doesn't tune out. Wood explains the game of Quidditch in a simple, tutorial-esque scene to Harry, and consequently ensures that the audience is set for the rest of the series. All the films have seriously hilarious moments in them, but this combination of this being the first Harry Potter film, Harry being the youngest in it, and therefore it being suitably sunny in tone, um, translates to the number of funny moments, although subtle, being quite plentiful. First of all, despite it being horrible that Harry has just been orphaned, anyone find it rather humorous that Hagrid arrives with Harry at Privet Drive in a baby carrier hung around his neck? You see it only briefly, but paints Hagrid as quite the motherly figure. Dudley, although being a real git, <laughs> I think is most hilarious in his most pathetic moments, which appear quite frequently in the first film. For example, when he arrives home from the zoo whimpering and looking like E.T. wrapped up in a blanket, or when Harry's Hogwarts letters start flying in through the fireplace at a considerable pace and Dudley jumps up onto his mum's lap as if he was 10 sizes and 10 years younger. Another moment that perhaps only I find funny is the fact that the wrapped up Philosopher's Stone in the vault at Gringotts really looks a lot like a little Christmas pudding. And with Hagrid saying, secret Hogwarts business, the whole seriousness of the situation seems rather silly. Also, another brief chuckle-inducing moment you might have missed is Filch barracking for Slytherin at the Quidditch match. It passes quickly, but it's golden. Now, I would have watched this film for the first time when I was about five years old, so it's hardly surprising that many things went straight over my head. Nor that I continue to misinterpret details throughout the later films. For example, who lives in an area called Little Whinging? When Harry's left on the Dursley's doorstep, I clearly failed to ever read the address in detail on the letter that Dumbledore addressed to the Dursleys, so it was only in the fifth film when Fudge is reading the charges laid against Harry that it actually clicked that that was the name of the place where he lives, not a name to describe Harry um, when he's doing a little whinging whenever he talks about the Dursleys. Also, the way Mr. Ollivander says yes when Harry eventually finds his wand was with such a peculiar accent and intonation that I always thought he was saying yikes in a baffled voice. Again, fail whale on my part. <laughs> but because I first saw this film at such a young age, I think I first had a very textual initial reading of it, filled with the sounds, music and movement of the film rather than the story. For example, when Harry asks Hagrid where the heck he's going to get all the money to buy all the things on his school list, and Hagrid says, Gringotts, the wizard bank. For me, that will always sound so out of place American. But speaking of this rather odd reading I initially took from the film, anyone else find it interesting that Hagrid's presence and confidence shrinks to the size of a schoolboy when conversing with the goblin bank teller about entering Harry's vault? Feeling that despite their contrasting sizes, he's intellectually inferior and incredibly self-conscious about the matter. For some reason, the moment when Harry stands on his broomstick like a surfboard in the Quidditch match and his little baby face glides towards the snitch, that always causes me to well up with tears. And the moment when Harry runs through the barrier onto platform nine and three quarters, instead of sharing his wow moment at the station that has miraculously appeared in front of him, I just want him to move out of the way of the barrier in case the Weasleys come through at any moment and crash into him. Speaking of platform nine and three quarters, in the background of a brief shot of the Hogwarts Express, fun fact is that you do actually see someone playing Neville's grandmother in the background, standing beside Neville while he like checks out the train. Speaking of odd, there are so many casting choices, makeovers and architectural shape shifts that don't flow on from the first film, which before getting all huffy about, I think it's important to remember that only the first three books had been released at the time of filming. Sure, the pointy black hats didn't last beyond the first film, nor did the actors who played Voldemort, Tom from The Leaky Cauldron, The Fat Lady or Angelina Johnson, and we see Professor Flitwick sporting look number one before he transitions to look number two, which consists of him sporting a uh, black haired bowl cut. <laughs> Sure, the grounds of Hogwarts, Quidditch pitch included look a tad animated at times, including the faces of those on broomsticks if you look really closely. Shh. <laughs> you should know that this even bummed out the production designer Stuart Craig, who said in an interview that the lack of architectural and geographical continuity of Hogwarts is something he finds most frustrating. But since they just didn't know of the boathouse, for example, um, at the start of filming, that would be the setting for such an important scene in the Deathly Hallows. 
It wasn't something that featured in the earlier films. Also, while so many of the magical beings are so believably brought to life in the film, like the goblins for example, in another interview I watched, I also got confirmation as to why the centaurs look particularly not real. Unlike so many of the other creatures, they don't really look like something we already know to exist in the muggle world, like a snake for a basilisk, a horse for the Thestral, or like a dog in relation to Fluffy. Instead, centaurs blend two creatures, horses with humans, which surprise surprise are rarely combined by us people, so they are perhaps innately hard to believe by us watching no matter how well they are depicted in films 1 and 5. But enough talking about everything other than Harry, Ron and Hermione, the classic comedic duo who bond in the film by bringing down a mountain troll and using their strengths to solve adult problems. The amount of eye roll acting in this film by the trio, as well as Filch, is actually so good, and something that is worth re-watching just to look out for. But in all seriousness, the origin story of the most iconic team is bloody brilliant and shows each of the highly flawed and human characters demonstrating their strengths in a sort of three-way yin-yang to overcome their goals. A seriously sweet detail that you might have missed are the handmade cards on Harry's bedside while he's in the hospital wing at the end of the film. I think Ron is my favourite character from the first film as his little face is just too cute and also the intense chess match played in the quest to save the Philosopher's Stone, filled with Hermione's flinching reactions, Ron's determined little eyebrow tense expressions, and percussion-filled music playing over the top is bloody brilliant. He's so in his element. But to finish, my favourite line from the whole film is when Dumbledore says to Harry in regards to the Mirror of Erised, It does not do to dwell on dreams, Harry, and forget. In this quote, Dumbledore, at least to me, encourages Harry to live, to enjoy friendship, love and happiness, which is everything Voldemort refuses to. In a way, from this line, it's hinted at that despite all Harry faces over the next seven years, he always, or for the most part, remembers to enjoy the friendships he has. And with that, let me now take you through the deliciousness from the film, in which I plant feel for your enjoyment, in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, but vegan. Let the feast begin. Hello honey bunches. It is so wonderful to be here finally with you doing this. Um, so let's get straight into it. There is heaps of food in the Philosopher's Stone. Um, heaps of inspiration is provided by two feasts happening. The welcoming feast and the Halloween feast. Um, doesn't really happen as we go forward into the series I guess because I've sort of laid the foundation that this happens at Hogwarts but also I imagine it would have been a logistical nightmare to make sure the actors don't eat what isn't food because I know not all of it wasn't real and that they had enough food and that no one got food poisoning. Anyway, the first recipe I'm going to veganize is Hagrid's birthday cake to Harry. Now that is a seriously lovely mop of um, pink icing on that cake and you do see Dudley eating it and it looks like a chocolate cake but hey, I took my cue from the pink icing to make a strawberry cake because I've been wanting to do that for a while. So I hope you're not too shocked at my creative interpretation and you're following with me and everything's dandy because this is a seriously good strawberry cake and I'm very proud of it. And I think it's a good, good homage with a vegan honey bunch twist to um, that Hagrid birthday cake. So you just whisk together the dry ingredients. It's like flour, almond meal, um, raising agents. Then you want to blend together the wet ingredients. And those red things are strawberry skins. Just the outer edges of the strawberry are the most flavorful. And along with strawberry jam, really help to give it a really wonderful strawberry flavor that you would totally be able to... Um, identify if you like ate it blindfolded I reckon. So there's like vanilla, um, apple cider vinegar, maple syrup, uh, plant milk um, in there and then you, I just mixed in some vegan butter because um, that was ready. That's why I didn't put it in with everything else. Anyway it looks like a weird smoothie that's not. Um, anyway you just make a well in the center of the dry ingredients, pour the wet into the dry and mix it together and bloom and heck look at that lovely pink color. That is definitely a strawberry cake batter if ever I saw one. So you just put it into the one cake tin. You do cut in the middle of it um, across it to put strawberry jam. So you could do it in two tins if you wanted, if you're a bit scared to do that. But I promise you, you can do it. It is not as hard as you think. So while, that, while that's cooling, um, I made the icing, which is vegan butter, vanilla and strawberry jam and icing sugar. The strawberry jam gives it a great strawberry flavor and color, meaning you don't have to use red food coloring, which is a major win. Um, yeah, and then that's what it looks like and we can build up our cake. Just a tip on the cake, definitely use a slow setting in your oven. That will make sure it doesn't have like a, a funky top, you know, where it's all puffy and not even. Um, so use a serrated knife to cut through it. And if you're really concerned about this, look, every time I do it, I'm like, I've totally stuffed it up. 
it's not going to be even and then I lift off the top layer and it's it's fine so have faith in yourself you can do it so you just want to um, put a nice thick lovely layer of strawberry jam in the middle and then plonk the top on top and <laughs> ice it I really need a large icing knife thingy mode bob I think I'm due for one of them that would make lots of things lots of lots of easier much easier <laughs> wow um, and then I just put strawberry rings around the outside to, I guess, like, indicate that it's definitely a strawberry cake. But this is a seriously good cake, honey bunches. It's like, oh, the flavour is so spot on. It's like a light, spongy kind of cake and, yeah, just heavenly. I really like it. Really recommend. And you can just swap out the gluten-free flour for regular if that's your thing. Um, but if you do use gluten-free flour, just don't store it in the fridge because that kind of dries it out, i found, with gluten-free things. But, yeah, I was so excited when it worked because it's not gummy. Woohoo! Okay. The second recipe is found from the Halloween feast and ba bam that's what it is I'm taking that to be carrot cake because of the little carrots on top I'm pretty sure I'm right there so anyway I um, made a carrot cake surprise surprise and yeah it's just a great carrot cake recipe to have in your life going forward um, so it's put ingredients in the bowl nothing surprising about my method here flat milk grapeseed oil almond butter vanilla um, coconut sugar and carrots and a bit of salt and whisk that together. I've been so nervous about doing this voiceover honey bunches because everything else takes so many hours <laughs> that I want this to be extra special but kind of um, getting used to the fact that my voiceovers is uh, still coming from me. I haven't changed um, so they're gonna be as weird as inarticulate as usual. Anyway let's get back to cake. So I just put the dry ingredients on top Mix in some walnuts, you could also use pecans if that's your thing, or omit them if that's what you like to do. Bake it, and then I made the icing, which had a, has a lovely hint of lemon in it, um, which I think is really necessary to balance out like the earthy carrot cake. So yeah, definitely make a lemon icing if you can do it. And um, I didn't show you icing it because we've already done that, and I plonked some walnuts on top, and happy days! This was, this was a big hit with my family. I don't know, me with carrot cake, like I do like it, but you know, it's carrot cake. Anyway, it's great. But this last recipe, I bet you didn't see coming. So when Hagrid and Harry are talking about Voldemort, you know who, in the Leaky Cauldron, there's this mysterious bowl of stew happening. And I took that to be an Irish stew. Obviously, I don't think it would be an Irish stew because, well, they're in London, not Ireland or Dublin. Anyway, um, but Bloom and Hake, this is a great recipe and it's totally um, Leaky Cauldron type fare. Like, it's pl highly plausible that it could be something like this. And there's, like, bones in Harry's pot, what it looks like. So, um, this veganized version of some stewy type thing, I think, is I think is great. So, I hope you, once again, liking my creative um, direction that I'm taking. Um, so, yes, the meaty component is from mushrooms. So, chop up your mushrooms nice and chunky, even if you don't like them. Um, I always want to kind of chop them smaller, but they shrink down heaps. And then, again, when you cook it. So if you chop them up really small, your stew won't have much texture, which is a bit sad. So yeah, saute them and then add flour. I use gluten-free, but you can use plain to the um, celery, onion, carrot, um, shebang. Then you want to add some beer. Um, you can just Google whether the one you have is vegan, but you could also use white wine or Guinness if that's vegan. I don't really know my alcohol, so don't take my word for it, but a half a cup of something groggy is a great addition. Then you want to add some canned tomatoes, add your mushrooms back and add some stock. Now it's looking a great colour. We want to flavour it up so I put in some rosemary, some bay leaves, some sugar. I use coconut sugar, some mixed herbs and some salt and pepper. Now if you didn't like cook this on the stove in a oven safe pot then you want to transfer it to that. It made double this, I just used two smaller dishes. And then lay around some chunky potato slices and put over some knobs of butter. And this just creates the best topping ever to a stew. It's totally worth doing. Um, Cause the, it's like roast potatoes, but on the bottom they're still sort of stewy and saucy, but they're like golden on top and it's heavenly and I highly recommend. And it looks good. So if you want to make this for like a normal special wintry occasion, you're set. Yeah, so I really love this recipe, Honey Bunches, and I hope you too. Thank you so much for watching Honey Bunches. If you like the look of any of the recipes, you can find them all written up and ready to go on my blog, which will be linked in the description box below. Stay tuned for the next instalment of this Harry Potter but vegan series by subscribing if you haven't already. And I'll catch you on Instagram if you like between this video and the next one. It's just at Honey Bunch of Onion Tops. Okie dokie, thank you so much for watching again, Honey Bunches. Hope you're doing super well, and I'll see you soon.
Bye.